Welcome to our YouTube channel. My name is Bishop Brian Gallardo, and God has got some great things in store for you. What I want you to do is hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like this video. Comment in the comment section below. I want to hear from you. I want to hear how this message is stirring you in your spirit and building your faith. I started a brand new series at our church entitled The Reset. I want to take you in there because it's going to bless your life. Let's go. I want us all to repeat this phrase together. Say, how you view things is how you do things. Look at your neighbor and say, how you see it, how you going to do it. How we view church is how we're going to do church. We won't do church right if we don't see church right. So we want to make sure you see church right. So look at your neighbor and say, I see you right. Because the church is sitting next to you. Y'all missed it. It's okay. A year and a half ago, I had to go. The, I had to. I had. Well, I just went to the doctor a couple months ago. But a year and a half ago, my right eye started going blind. And when I was 21 years old, I had a cataract surgery on this eye due to a bottle rocket injury. Moral of the story is: don't have bottle rocket fights. Praise God. I got shot in the mouth with a bottle rocket. Trauma caused a cataract on this eye, and they put a lens in there. And about a year and a half ago, I woke up and I noticed that I was starting to not be able to see. And progressively through the year, I ended up going blind in that eye. And I was trying to, you know, be all macho and act like I'm all right, you know, my life is good, real good. And I, everywhere I'd go, I'd go to Starbucks and I couldn't see, the, couldn't see the cup and I'd hit it with my hand and spill it. I was sitting in a very important meeting in Chattanooga. Well, not Chattanooga, some little town. I don't know what the name of it is. Tennessee with some big heavy hitters in the room and I spilt coffee all over myself. I was so embarrassed. I was driving down the interstate and I about ran three people off the road in three different occasions because I couldn't see them on the right hand side. So I decided to obey my wife and I went and had a doctor's appointment I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, there's buildup on the back of that lens. And we're going to have to take a laser and go in there and knock all that out. He said, you won't feel nothing. That wasn't true. He said, you won't feel nothing. It's in and out. You'll have no complications from this new reset of vision. He said, you'll be totally fine. It wasn't true. He lied. It wasn't supposed to be that way, but we got into the doctor's office and he looked back there in my eye. He said, my goodness, I've never seen that much build up on the back of a lens before. He said, it's going to take a while. They started zapping that laser back into my head and it felt like pop rocks going off in my brain. I looked, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, ah, fire. And... They blasted that thing about 25 times. Duh, 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 duh. He backed up and he said, now how do you see? I said, I can't see nothing. I'm blinded, even worse. He said, we'll sit there for 15 minutes. And all of a sudden, the darkness started to go away. And I can finally see out of this eye. He literally reset the vision. Now... I'm not spilling no more. That's my testimony. I'm not running people up the highway no more. And here's what I know about vision in a church. If the vision isn't clear, we're going to cause more problems in the community than we will help. We're going to detour people and run them off the road. Come on. We're going to do a lot of spillage and make a mess of the name of Jesus in the community. And God wants the vision in this church to be crystal clear. So you have an understanding of who we are as a church, where we're going as a church, and what God has called us to become as a church. Look at your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, I'm glad you're sitting next to me, but God's about to fix your vision. I was talking with Elder Johnson before service. How many of y'all appreciate Elder Johnson? Isn't she amazing? She is precious as a Willy Wonka chocolate bar and a bar of gold. She's precious and valuable to me. How about you? Is she to you? 
So she was walking to church. I said, I like them glasses, Elder Johnson, because now I'm paying attention. I got, I got to get new glasses. And she goes, I said, are those transitionals or, or do those change in the sun? She goes, oh, listen, she didn't know what I was preaching. And she said, Bishop, vision is so important. She said, if your eyes go bad, you're going to get in the world a mess. I said, ooh, Jesus. I said, that's what I'm preaching on today is vision. I said, I'll take that as confirmation of the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Toast. Praise the Lord. What y'all said, that was prophetic, not prophetic. Praise God. And our vision matters. When y'all agree? It matters what we see in the world. It matters how we're looking through the world. It matters what lens that we have on our vision in the spirit so we know where we can see. And I just want to help you today to understand that this church is not my church. This is not Gallardo's church. This church is not the people's church. This church is not the incorporation on the paper's name church. This church is God's church. This is the church that belongs to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Come on in here. I remember when we, we changed the name to LifeGate, the other name I was thinking of was, but it wasn't God, I was thinking it, was the name The People's Church. And so I asked my name, my, one of my mentors, I said, what do you think about the word People's Church? He said, I think that's heresy. I said, what do you mean? He goes, it ain't The People's Church. It's The Lord's Church. So the Lord has a global church. Everybody say Global. It's the universal church. It's, it's the, the, the same church that's here today. We have brothers and sisters in the underground church in China that are having church. Well, probably they've already had it or they're going to have it. They're probably still sleeping. But they're going to have church today at some point where they're going to lift up the name of the same Jesus. They're going to shout just like we're shouting. They're going to read from the same scriptures we're reading from. They're our brother and they're our sister. I'm going to step into Ghana in a couple weeks, in a couple months, and I'm going to stand in Togo, Africa, and my brothers and sisters that are there are just as much a part of the church as you're a part of the church. The church is global. It's the greatest institution on the planet. We are not losing. We are gaining momentum and we are winning. More people are joining the church in the globe than any other institution on the planet earth. Aren't you glad you belong to an epicenter? A place that's literally shaking the earth. For I'm getting to a text. Hang on. There's a global church, then there's a local church. Every local church is different. You have some local churches, they're all one race. I got quiet, praise God. Some churches are all Democrats. Help them, Lord. Some churches are all Republicans. Help them, Lord. Some churches are very confused. Amen, church. But, but they're all different for a reason. Those different churches can communicate to people we can't communicate to. But LifeGate communicates to a group of people nobody else can communicate to. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad we communicate to you. I mean, look at the different in our church. We've got Democrats here, Republicans. We have us black folks, some white folks. We have Hispanic folks. You know, we got all different kind of folks. Miss Dorothy, Miss Dorothy said, you one of us. I said, I'm one of you. She said that. She said that at the Church of God in Christ message I preached a couple of weeks ago on, on Good Friday. But th this, is a, this is a community church. We we're supposed to look like the community. Well, there's not just white people in Kansas City. There's not just black people in Kansas City. There's not just Mexicans in Kansas City. It, Kansas City is a melting pot. Amen, church. So we want to be effective in the community. So part of who we are, part of our DNA can be found in the book of Isaiah where the Bible said when the mountain of the Lord's house would be established, all nations are going to flow into it. We believe that this is an apostolic church where the nations are flowing into it, where ethnos, ethnic groups are called to come and be a part of this. Come on to here. We ain't called just to one set of people we're not called to just one skin tone of people we are called to look like heaven I dare you to look at somebody right in the eye and say I'm glad I'm sitting next to a resemblance of heaven well then what's the structure of what church ought to look like let's go to Psalm chapter 133 is this okay today 
I finally got to the scripture, and here we go. Psalm 133, and we're going to read verse 1. We're going to break it down. We're going to read verse 2. We're going to break it down. We're going to read verse 3, and then I'm going to give you the, the vision of LifeGate Church and where we're going. Some people will be new. Some people, you'll hear the old language. It's just rebranded a little bit different because that's where God is calling us. Psalm 133, verse 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is to the Lord for brethren to speak in tongues loudly. How pleasant it is to the Lord when people give big bucks at church. How pleasant it is to the Lord when we shout and dance louder than anybody. No, it's how pleasant it is to God. How pleasing it is to the Lord when the brothers and the sisters walk together in unity. Here's a word of affirmation for our church. We are called to unite as a people group. We may not agree on everything, but we're going to have to be, we're going to have to agree intentionally on some things. Amen. We need to celebrate what we agree upon. Come on. We agree about life. We agree about salvation. We agree about doctrine. We agree about liberty. We agree that God ought to have his way. We ought to agree about salvation from an eternal hell. We got to get into agreement and in unity with our brothers and our sisters. Well, Bishop, they're not like us. That's good because we couldn't have a whole church full of people like you. We'd be in a mess. We need different in the church. But we have to learn how to take each other's differences, celebrate them, so we can walk in unity with diversity. Where there is no unity, there's no agreement. Where there's no agreement, there is no power. Ask Joshua, march around his city and be quiet. But on the seventh day, then you can shout. What if somebody got in discord with Joshua? I'm not shouting. I don't believe in all that shouting stuff. I'm just an introverted person. I came for the experience. No. They would have broke the unity and the power would not have manifested. What would have happened in Acts chapter number two? The Bible said they began to pray and were all in one accord. God is calling the church to disagree with the culture. Stop being so divisive. Stop being so critical. Stop being so opinionated and get in to unity. Because see, here's what culture is telling you. Culture is teaching us that everybody has an opinion. Everybody can criticize everybody. Well, no, you can't. You're supposed to manifest the fruit of the Holy Ghost. Long-suffering. Patience with one another. Come on and hear kindness. My God, these are cuss words in today's culture. Well, I think, well, I think. If, you're, if your sentence starts off well with what I think, you need to just close that mouth a little bit. Pray on what you think. Get in the Word and see what the Word thinks. And then walk it out. I, I was on, you know, God, God's been blessing me. I've led 35 people to Jesus on YouTube in like three weeks. Come on. God is, God is expanding our reach online, and it's been amazing. I'm so thankful for it. On Instagram, God has expanded us on there this year. We've gotten like 25,000 people following us this year on my Instagram account. And I posted this picture of my wife and I the other day. Uh, it was actually on our anniversary, which is in July the 12th, 2003. See, I know when we got married. And so... I posted this picture, and for some weird reason, it trended and went viral. So, you know, I'm either like Jason Kidd online or I'm Pitbull. People are really confused. Is this like a Pitbull preacher or a Jason Kidd preacher? I said, thank you. A Holy Ghost filled version. I'd like to have their money, praise the Lord. And somebody posted on the comment section, my wife and I, I left it up, y'all can go see it. They said, what is this? This looks like an episode of Dateline where a husband murdered his wife. And these are the pictures for that program. So because they talked to my wife I, about my wife, I don't take that too kindly. Somebody said, well, you ought to manifest the fruit of the spirit to them. Oh, it was the fruit, but it wasn't the spirit. Praise the Lord. I wasn't manifesting the fruit. I was getting a little fruité. And, you know, so I got on us. I was sarcastic and I said, well, praise the Lord. God bless you for your kindness. Thank you. Unity is learning to close our opinions down. We're not going to agree on everything. How could we agree on everything? 
You're talking age. Come on. You can't take a greatest and a Gen Zer and expect them to agree. Come on. My grandma's 92, and she still don't understand why this is painted black and why I don't wear a tie every Sunday. Don't even get me started about my tattoos. I strike going to hell when she found that out. I'm in hell, hell fire. Right? Sorry, Grandma. I hope you're not watching today. I love you. <laughs> but two generations think two different ways. How are we going to walk in agreement and unity as the people of God with 300 different thought processes? We have to be intentional. That's what we have to do. Unity is very important. I'm going to read the next verse here in a minute, but I, I'm on this unity thing I want to say. for just It's very, very, very important for the advancement of LifeGate Church so that God's kingdom can be pushed through us throughout the city. Here's why. Look at verse 2 and 3. Now, the it here, everybody say the it here. The it here, the it here in context with proper hermeneutics of Scripture is talking about unity. The unity, amen, thank you. The unity is like the precious ointment upon the head. Now, Paul taught us that the head of the church is Jesus. Who's the head of the church? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Who do you love? Jesus. Who set you free? Jesus. Who saved your body? Jesus. Who saved your soul? Jesus. Who revived your spirit? Jesus. You got to say it like that. Jesus. 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 Okay, so the unity. How many of y'all know Jesus is anointed? I mean, Jesus is not his first name and Christ is not his last name. Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. So Yeshua, the anointed one and his anointing. Jesus carries the oil for the church. But you notice not every church has the oil in it. I've been to some churches that, uh, listen, it was so dead, I thought I was at a funeral parlor. Let the church say amen. amen. No shout, no victory. Everybody was depressed. Everybody was anxious. I mean, from the preacher to the party, everybody was bound up by Satan, smoking dope, drinking, sleeping around, and they acted like they was a church. They weren't the church because Christ ain't there. Where the head is, you'll find the oil. So this unity is likened to the oil on the Lord's head. That's powerful. The unity amongst the brother and sisters is like the anointing on Jesus. There's no greater anointing. I'm talking dead raising. Eye opening. Lazarus. Come forth anointing. Walking on water anointing. Calming the rage and sea anointing. He was dead for three days, but on the third day, he got up anointing. Come on, somebody. He was born of a virgin named Mary anointing. He is now Emmanuel, God who is with us. He's right here in this moment. Kind of anointing. The unity is like the oil on Jesus. He's the head. But it flows down to the beard, which is around the mouth. And the Bible says it ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. So it goes from Jesus to an earthly priest, headship in a church. It goes from Christ oil and his oil flows downward to the mouthpiece of God who stands before you preaching every single week. And then it leaves the mouthpiece of God and it gets all down upon the body of Christ. That's y'all. Yeah. So when we get in unity, it causes the oil, y'all hear me just a minute. It causes the oil to flow from the throne of God into the mouthpiece of God and out on the body. So when we're walking in discord with each other, you don't like somebody because of whatever goofy reason you don't like them, you got to get over yourself with some of this stuff. Come on. Don't let culture get on you. Don't let the lies of culture get on. Well, I don't like them because of the color of their skin. I don't like them because of filling the blank. You better get over that cultural lie in the name of Jesus because where there's no unity, there's no oil. Where there's no oil, there's no power. Where there's no power, there's no signs, miracles, wonders, and deliverance. We got to get the headship of Jesus, the mouthpiece 
house of God and the body to get the oil. Somebody say you better reset it. Look at your neighbor say you better reset it. Look at the person behind you and say push that reset button. Ephesians chapter number four. How do we reset it? Well, you got to get in order. That's a cuss word in church. Ain't going to tell me what to do. I'll just give you a one star Google review. I'm a poet. You didn't even know it. Don't tell me what to do. You'll get that bad review. That's my motto. But that's anti-Bible. It's anti-kingdom. Paul said in Hebrews, obey your spiritual leaders and submit to their authority. Now, if a leader's being abusive, you don't need to submit to their authority. If ever I get to an abusive state, you need to go tell Berta who will call Bishop Hart, who will handle me and come down from this pulpit and rebuke me in front of you. That's the order. Three claps. Praise the Lord for that. That's important because there's so many, there's so much corruption in the church today. I mean, we're seeing it left and right. It seems like I pray every week, Lord, please, not another story. God, please, not another pastor. Please, not another church, Lord. Please, God, please, 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 please. And we want the church people safe. We want you to feel safe. So there is a system set in place if I go sideways. First, my wife kicks my butt. (laughs) Then Berto will kick my butt. Then elders will kick my butt. Then Bishop, you don't even want him kicking your butt. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's look at the order. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 11 through 12. We're going to end in verse 15. Jesus himself gave some apostles. Now, these words we don't use anymore in American culture. Like, if you use the word apostle in the American church, the church makes fun of you. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? It means they have a bishopric role where they're called to the nations, and they're called to oversee churches. And they're called to encourage other pastors and uproot bad thinking. That's what an apostle is. So, so God gave an apostle. God gave the prophet. The prophet is you better turn back to Jesus. You, you, I can hear what God is saying in the earth today and you better turn back to Jesus. That was last week you got the prophet. Amen, church. And then there's the evangelist like Brother Jeff and like I aspire to be. I want to lead people to Jesus every week. Amen. How many led anybody to Jesus this week? Can I see a show of hands? Anybody? Let me see. Come on, Donnie. What? Come on, Samantha. What? Come on, Noah. Come on, y'all. Give them some, give them a hand clap of a encouragement. You better do that. It's going to get more, too. Elder Jennifer told me she finally witnessed to her neighbor that she's like, she's like Bishop, I, I was, I got to tell my testimony, I got to pray for her. She didn't accept Christ yet, but she's going to. I don't know why I haven't been doing this before. It was amazing. So we're all called to be evangelists. And then there's some pastors. We're supposed to pastor the sheep. That's why you're on our married finger here. Uh, You know, I don't wear the bishop ring on there because I'm not married to you. I'm married to my wife first, married to the church second. Amen, church. And, And then there's teachers. The teacher is the part of the hand where it gets in where the others can't. So all these gifts ought to be able to teach. Now, what's my purpose? What is the purpose of the mouthpiece? Verse 12 tells us. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. This is not talking about your personal ministry outside of church. This is talking about your ministry within the church. So we're not called to come and sit. We're saved to serve. So when you get saved, then God puts a ministry on your heart to do within the church. Y'all ain't saying anything. It's okay. I mean, I mean, come on, Haley. If, if you could have one Sunday or two Sundays off in a row, how would you feel? She'd probably feel pretty good. She'd been doing that since she was a little kid. She'd been working kids' ministry. She's like, I'm a kid. I'm staying. I'm staying with Brittany. I'm going to stay in the kids' ministry. And she stayed. Every Sunday almost. But what if other people stood up to help in kids' ministry to give Miss Haley a little break? So my job as a pastor and a leader in the church is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Now, we should all have outside ministries. We should all be read like Samantha. She got outside ministry. She led somebody to Jesus this week. What? So I'm to equip you. Then secondly, I'm to edify the body. Edify. Everybody say edify. 
Build you up, tear you down. Build you up, tear you down. Build up faith, tear down strongholds. Build up godliness, tear down worldly culture. Build up what the Bible says, tear down what the world says. Come on. Build up kingdom, tear down the lies in your family. Come on in here. Just because your mom and them said it don't mean it's true. I'm glad I got somebody up in here saying amen. Verse number 13, until we reach the unity in the faith, until we reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, not manure, but mature. To reach the unity in the faith of Jesus. What do you believe in God for? You say, Bishop, I ain't believe God for nothing. We got to fix that. Yeah. I'm believing God for my neighborhood to get saved. I'm believing God to do something supernatural here with our finances. Like I'm looking in the I'm looking in the mailbox every single week. God, I need three million. I already asked you three million dollars to build a facility for our kids and for the youth to come. That's about to come on, come on in here. So we're going to bring you into the unity and the faith of Jesus. Whatever you need Jesus to do, I'm to equip you and pull you into that faith. Faith for healing, faith for deliverance, faith for your family to be saved, faith for that multi-million dollar company that God put into your heart, faith for blessing for your children, faith to have children, faith that your marriage won't be like your parents' marriage. What? And, oh, I know it's a cuss word. I'm called to bring you into maturity so that you're no longer like babies. Toss to and fro. We got to take out the binkies. We got to take out the bottles. Please take off the diapers unless you need them medically. We understand what I'm saying. Like, If you're 30 and you think you're normal and you're still, still wearing a diaper, that's a medical problem. If, you, if you've been going to church for 30 years and you're still cussing out the people in the parking lot, you got a problem. If you've been kicked out of the last four churches you've been to, it ain't the churches, it's you. Hello, church. If every place you go, people have a problem with you and they're always confronting you, it's not them, it's you. I'm calling you into maturity. Okay, let's go to verse 15 because i got to hurry up. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become and ever respect the mature body of Christ. So I have to preach the truth. The truth hurts sometimes, don't it? And that truth has to be given in love. I'm not up here being passionate and sweating like this because I ain't got nothing else to do. I love the church. I love God's people. I love drummers and, and for Jesus and organists and piano players for Jesus and bass guitarists for Jesus and I love singing about Jesus and preaching about Jesus and having Holy Ghost altar calls. I love every bit of it. I'm a church guy. But we got to come into maturity. Come on, don't we? We got to come into maturity. You know, the average person comes to church in this nation one every six weeks. We got to come up out of all that. Come on. We got to come up out of all that. We got to get our hunger back. I was talking to Olivia before church, my beautiful daughter, for our first time guest stand up, sweetheart. My gun collection is growing, by the way. Um, that's my daughter. She said, Daddy, she said, how come, how come, like, how we used to, how they used to have church back in the 90s and stuff, where they would have, like, week-long services, and people were just so hungry, they'd be lined up around, why, why don't we do that anymore? I said, baby, it's kind of like if you go to a buffet, and you eat so much, and you eat so much, and you eat so much, and you're like, I can't take another bite. I said, that's where American culture is. We have consumed it, but we haven't given it. And so because we consume it, there's no more room to get full. Four people said, I led somebody to Jesus this week. What? What if we all left here and didn't just consume it, but we gave it every time we had an opportunity? <laughs> Have you ever heard the story of Jesus? That's the intro question number two. What are you doing with it? Yeah. I just told you how to preach the gospel. What are you doing with Jesus? Yeah. Preach the gospel yeah. and give it away. Amen. Because vision matters. Okay. How many of y'all like to go fishing? I love fishing. For five minutes. If they ain't biting Jeremiah, I'm done in five minutes. That's it. But the thing about fishing, now this is a little fishing pole that belongs to Chop, who is a fireman. He can't be here every Sunday, but we honor him for serving our community. Can the church say amen? So he let me borrow this. 
and his sweet wife is our children's director and killing it. What? But here's what I know about fishing. The first thing you got to do is you got to get some bait or a lure on there. If you're, if you're from down south, they'll say lure. Chop might say that too. I don't know. But you have to cast that thing into the water. And then you have to slowly, it's called, I think it's called trolling. Different definition of what trolling means today. Especially if you're on social media. Praise God. Okay. And the fish have to grab what's being casted. Here's my question to you over the next four or five weeks. Are you going to catch what I'm casting? Are you going to catch this vision? Am I going to see you next week? Are you going to get hungry for what God wants to do at LifeGate Church? I want you to say this out of your mouth. Say, the reset. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to reset you today. Vision matters. Everything you do in life is going to die without vision. The writer in the Bible said that where there is no vision, the people perish and they die. Whatever doesn't have vision in your life will die. That's why some people picked up a book. You read one chapter in January for your New Year's resolution and you never picked it up again because you lost vision. It's why some people write a vision, a business plan for a business that's going to make you millions of dollars. But when the truth came down to the the wire you got lazy and you dropped your vision and now that vision is dead it works in church too if you don't pick up what's being casted and you don't pick up the vision and write it down and run after what God has for you you're going to lose the responsibility that God put on you to see the vision work everybody say responsible, responsible. say responsibility. responsibility say it belongs to me now look at this word here, responsibility. It's your response with your abilities. Every person in this church has an ability. Everybody does. Everybody can do something the next person cannot do. I mean, look at Justin. Oh, studly Justin. He can straight run that parking lot. He's good at it. But what if Brother Pritchard, who's good at running the parking lot too, said, oh, I don't need to do it. He's doing a good job. I don't need to respond. He would be losing the ability to respond with his own personal ability. And then the vision within him for the kingdom will die. We all have something we're called to in this church. We all have something we're called to outside of the church. What are you using with your abilities and your response? So three things, three things. I'm wrapping it on up, Jeremiah, kind of. Three things. I won't be before you long. Three things, in conclusion. <laughs> three things about LifeGate Church. This is our vision, our DNA, our culture, what we're supposed to do as a church. Number one, we're going to praise the Lord. Yes. We're a praising church. Well, that makes me uncomfortable. Well, we're not here to make you uncomfortable. We want God comfortable. Come on, church. We're a praising church. We a preaching church. And we're going to empower the people. So we preach to Jesus. I'm sorry. We praise to Jesus. We preach to people. And then we empower the people. We praise Jesus. We preach to people. And we empower the people. Now the word praise is a word that most churches in America don't really see take place in their church. Psalm 150 and verse 1 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. So if we bow to culture and say, that's not my personality, are we bowing to people? Or are we bowing to what God wants? Praise God in his. Praise God in his. For the Baptist in the back seat, say praise God in his sanctuary. Now, then he says, praise him in the mighty heavens. Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So would you agree we should be looking like heaven? We should look like heaven. We should talk like heaven. We should, we should walk in the room and demons tremble because we have heaven in us. 
if one person says to me the devil was with me all night long, I'm going to slap you with the Bible. All you got to do is say, get out of my house in Jesus' name. So the Bible gives us a picture in Revelation 19 of what praise in heaven looks like. Five, five things, four things. Number one, the Bible says that praising rings out. Revelation 19 and verse 3. It rings out of heaven. Now, this isn't really what heaven looks like. This is AI's best job at coming up with a picture to make it look like heaven. The Bible said the, gold, the, 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 the skyscrapers in heaven are 1,400 feet right into the air made of solid gold. Streets are paved in gold. I don't think you ought to wear all them nice things. I'm trying to look like heaven. You crazy? If there's gold in heaven, I want gold in my pocket. Praise the Lord. Why y'all looking at me crazy? Jesus said, if you broke, go catch a fish and I'll put some gold in its mouth. And the Bible said they went down and went fish and he opened up the fish's mouth and there was a gold nugget in that mouth of that fish. Lord, put that gold nugget right there, Jesus. Where we get off on all this craziness in church? Preachers ought not be blessed. We ought not be blessed. Don't listen. Don't, you can't judge your neighbor when they pull up on this parking lot in a brand new Cadillac, a brand new Bentley, a brand new Rolls, a brand new Porsche, and God blesses them. What y'all looking at? Some of you ought to be driving it in Jesus' name. <laughs> thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth, the wealth on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the praise on this earth as it is in heaven. Praise is ringing out, but not just any kind of praise. He goes on in verse 6 to say, it's the praise that sounds like a massive crowd. A massive crowd. Oh, 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 oh. I was there the day they broke that decibel record. Quest, nobody said. I didn't see a single person say, I think it's a little too loud. Yeah. They was acting crazy. Big old dudes, no shirt on, painting their whole bodies red, freezing cold, paying $29 for a water, talking about all the church wants is your money and it's too loud. The devil is a liar. Why y'all being quiet? Why is Arrowhead louder than the church? Arrowhead did nothing for nobody. Patrick Mahomes never saved nobody. Kelsey never set the captive free. And y'all know Taylor Swift they told, ain't taking nobody out of hell. Our praise ought to sound like heaven. Then he gives another example. He said, like the roar of an ocean wave and like the crash of loud thunder. I don't know what your concept is of praise LifeGate Church in the year 2024 in the United States of America, but it don't look like this. It's full of volume, full of passion, full of energy, and full of excitement. Can you stand up on your feet, church, and give God about three seconds of praise in his sanctuary? Shout the reset. We're going to reset the praise of the house. We're going to praise with passion. We're going to praise with exuberance. We're going to clap our hands, shout, and declare the Lord the winner. Let's go. Number two. I'm almost done. In conclusion, I won't be before you long. Number two, we're a preaching church. I am not Tony Robbins. Thank God. I'm not Dr. Phil. He's got a good haircut, but I'm not Dr. Phil. I'm not, pre now President Obama's a good, he's a good, I don't believe in his beliefs, but he can, he's a good communicator. His wife, she's even better. I'm not a politician. Y'all got really, you, did you vote for it? Did you hear what I just said? I said he can communicate well, I don't believe in his beliefs. But he's a gifted communicator. I'm not a politician. 
I'm not a most motivational speaker. I'm not preaching with a latte on my pulpit. No condemnation to those who do that. It almost sounded like I was judging. No condemnation. I'm just saying for me. I sweat when I preach. I grew up under Holy Ghost preaching. I am not a talker. I'm a preacher of the Bible, of the Word of God. I'm a preacher. Come on in here. And America has been so duped to thinking every preacher got to look like a motivational speaker. Honey, I've been branded by the fire. He took hot coals and touched my lips. I'm going to preach with passion. I'm going to preach with fire. I'm going to preach with the yes in my spirit. Well, show me some Bible. I'm glad you asked. Acts chapter number 2, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11 disciples, apostles, and he raised his voice and preached to the crowd. Revelation 14, 7, the angel preached with a loud voice. Actually, the Greek word is mega voice. Matthew 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching and preaching. They're two different things. You didn't sign up in this church for a talker. You signed up for a preacher. I'm going to stand flat-footed, lift up my Bible, speak in a mic microphone and preach the unadulterated word of God. If you believe that too, you ought to shout amen. amen. Now there's a difference between preaching and teaching. I just read to you, Jesus went throughout teaching and preaching. They're two different things. Preaching breaks the barrier. Anointed teaching breaks the stronghold. A stronghold isn't you chained in the spirit. A stronghold is you chained in your mind. So the way you think about things. As a man thinketh, so is he. Right? If you thinketh it's okay to have sex before marriage and shack up and live with somebody, that's a stronghold because it's not biblical. You can't do that and be saved. Y'all know that, right? You, you can't smoke the devil's lettuce and think God's okay with that. And I don't know why in our culture, one of the dumbest concepts, I'm probably going to get some flack for this, but I don't care, is how can you justify using the F word and S-H-I-T and all the other words and say it's okay for Christians to cuss? What Bible are you reading? Oh, wait, you're not reading it. Let no filthy communication come up out of your mouth except that which is edifying. Do not conform to the systems, the ways, the patterns of the world. It's a big debate amongst Jen's ears. Well, cussing's okay. You can cuss a little and be saved. The devil is a liar. See, that's teaching. You got to uproot that thinking. That's what anointed teaching does. But anointed teaching, anointed preaching breaks the barriers. It is why Peter could stand up and preach and people got baptized instantly in the Holy Ghost because the preaching broke a barrier. It opened up a window. It opened up the window to the supernatural. It's biblical. Read the book of Acts. It's important for you to read the book of Acts. We're going to push the reset. I dare you just to lift your hand like this and push that metaphoric button that you can't see and say reset. So then your response to the preaching of the word is found in your amen. amen. Sorry, Kelsey. Acts 10 44 says this. Nope, go to the next one. Go to the next verse. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, there we go. 2 Corinthians. For no matter how many promises God has made, I'm a promise preaching somebody. I'm going to preach the Bible. I'm not going to preach the culture. I'm not going to preach the color of your skin. I'm not going to preach what your mom and them taught you. I'm going to preach the Bible. I don't preach the Democrat. I don't preach the Republicanism or the Democrat theology. I preach the Bible. I don't preach your white theology, your black theology, your Mexican theology. I'm going to preach the Bible. For no matter how many promises God has made, the answer is yes in Jesus. And so through him, the amen is spoken by the body. So when I preach and it jumps in your spirit, you ought to say amen. When I say something that ministers to your heart, you ought to say something. Amen. Whether it be preach, rabbi, somebody said that to me before. Watch your tone. You walk in heavy today. You better say that. Come on, preacher. All right now, bishop. Whatever you're going to say, say the amen. amen. If I say Jesus is our healer. Amen. If I say Jesus is our deliverer. Amen. If I say he's our savior. Amen. You ought to say something. Amen. 
in the 90s, we waved hankies like this. Y'all remember that in the 90s? In the 90s, preach on, preach up, preach on, preach up, preach on, preach on. I'm going to preach on. That's all I'm going to do. We have to, it's a call and response. Come on in here. You're as much a part of the preaching as I am. Do you realize your faith can set your neighbor free? What's on the inside of you can deliver the person sitting next to you? I hope you don't come to church looking for faith. I hope you bring your faith with you. We're going to praise here. I'm already, I know I'm, I'm making a division in the church right now. I don't know if this church is for me. Y'all are awfully radical. L listen to what your brain thinks. You're awfully radical. This is just too radical for me. Y'all are too loud. You're too passionate about God for me. I, that's, I'm not comfortable with this level of enthusiasm. <laughs> Bartimaeus, let me, let me show you how religious that is. An anti-Bible. Bartimaeus was blind. The Bible said he began to shout, Jesus, son of David. And all the disciples, the church folk around Jesus said, I'm not, hey, there's no need for all that enthusiasm. You, you just be still and know he's God. You can do that in your heart, brother Bartimaeus. And the Bible said he shouted louder. And that got God's attention. That was for all the choir religious people that don't believe in shouting. Because when I think about the goodness of God, I can't shut up. I can't sit still. Hey! Number three, here's the third part of our vision. Not only are we a praising church, that's what we do. We do not apologize. I won't apologize for it. We're here to praise the king of glory. He doesn't inhabit the quietness of his people. He inhabits the halal of his people, which means to throw a party for him. That's what the Bible say. We are praising church. It's a preaching. I'm a preacher. Number three. I'm going to conclude right here. We're going to teach this next week, the three. But we are going to empower the people. So I'm going to teach this point next week because there's four ways we're going to empower people. And I want you to catch what I'm casting. Number one, we're going to find them. We're going to become a soul win in church like never before. I can't wait for the day when I say, who led somebody to Jesus this week? Everybody's hands go up. Remember, all you got to say is, have you heard the story of Jesus? What are you doing with it? That's it. You can preach the gospel right there. Two points. We're going to find them. We're going to find you. We're going to find you. better hide your kids. Hot. Yeah, we're going to find you. We're going to find them. Number two, we're going to free them. This is a deliverance church. You should have heard these kids testifying Wednesday night. Kids saying, I got set free of homosexual thoughts. I got set free of pornography. I got set free of suicide at camp. We're a deliverance church. Come on in here. That's awesome. Then we're going to fill them. We're going to see them get filled with the Holy Ghost. And then number four, next week's going to be raw. It's going to be wild. Some of y'all might get filled with the Holy Ghost. And number four, we're going to form them through discipleship. So we're going to find them. This is how we empower. Finding them. Freeing them. Filling them forming them that's what we're going to do next week are you going to catch what I'm casting who's going to catch it who's going to catch it are you going to praise him are you going to preach him are we going to empower each other so empowerment doesn't come from here to there although it does it's twofold. That's not the only place. Empowerment comes when Justin empowers Brother John. That's empowerment. I may be at the office. Y'all may be at Starbucks. Hello, church. Empowerment might be when you take something from the pulpit that Pastor Jillian says, ladies, and you go home and speak life to your husband. Empowerment. We're going to praise. We're going to preach. We're going to empower. 
And we're going to forget the pastor. Praise God. We're going to praise. We're going to preach. And we're going to empower. Praise. Preach. Empower. We're going to praise. Preach. And empower. I'm so thankful that you tuned in today. I pray that today's message stirred your faith up and ministered life to your spirit. Connect with us and let us hear from you, whether it's in the comment section below or you email the church. We want to hear from you. We hope that this video ministered life to you and that we'll see you right here next time on this amazing channel on our YouTube platform. God bless you.